So uh, last time we, uh, we started a discussion about uh, colors and, uh, and the spectrum as well as the wavelength in, in media. So just as a reminder, uh, uh, color is something that happens uh, in our brain and therefore it has something to do with how our eyes are built as well as with the physics of, uh, of light. And we have three primary colors uh, because we have three receptors in the eye that are sensitive to different wavelengths. In physics, we use only wavelength and frequency, so the color is just the relative sensation of the receptors. So uh, this is the uh, visible spectrum from 400 nanometers to a little bit uh, beyond 700 nanometers. We also discussed last time that uh, when uh, light enters a medium, then the boundary between one medium and the, uh, and the other medium can only have uh, one frequency. And therefore the frequency of a wave is not changed when it uh, moves across the boundary. Since the speed changes from C to V over N, uh, the wavelength has to change. And that means that the wavelength in the medium of, uh, with refractive index N has to be uh, the uh, speed in that medium, of course, divided by f, which is c over nf. And that means that the wavelength in a medium is shorter by 1 over n compared to that in vacuum. So let's look at an example. Uh, let's say uh, we have an object that emits 650 nanometer light in air. And we see that as red. But this is only true in air. If you observe the same object when underwater, it still looks red. Even though the wavelength in water, which is lambda n, is uh, 650 nanometers uh, over 1.33, which is about 489 nanometers, light of that wavelength would look blue in air. And the question is, why doesn't the light appear blue when observed underwater? The answer is that uh, our color receptors in the eye uh, must be sensitive to frequency rather than wavelength. And since the frequency is not changed underwater, the light still looks red. However, we still classify color by wavelength rather than frequency because it is easier to uh, measure wavelengths than it is to measure frequency since the optical frequencies are so high about uh, on the order of 10 to the 14 hertz. Let me now uh, discuss refraction on, uh, on two surfaces. And we've already uh, gone through an example where we uh, talked about the refraction of a slab of glass, where the two surfaces are parallel. If we put them at an angle, we get a prism. So let's say we have uh, two surfaces at an angle alpha, and we have glass inside and air on the outside. And now we strike it with some incident ray. It gets refracted at one surface, and then it gets refracted at the other surface. And uh, we know from Snell's law how to uh, get this angle theta 1 from the incident angle. We, we know that sine theta 1 equals sine theta incident uh, times the ratio n air over n glass. And to get the other angles, we, uh, we look at this triangle. This angle here is the same angle alpha that we have here. And the reason for that is because uh, these are normals, these dotted lines. And the two normals intersect each other uh, with the same angle as the original uh, uh, planes did. And since this is angle alpha, then uh, this must be the complementary angle, pi minus alpha. And so we know that the sum of these three angles theta 1 plus theta 2 plus pi minus alpha must be equal to, uh, to pi 180 degrees. And that means that the sum of theta 1 and theta 2 must equal alpha. Given that we have uh, this relation, uh, we can uh, express now the sine of theta 2 as the sine of alpha minus theta 1. And using one of the trigonometric identities, uh, we are getting that this is sine alpha cosine theta 1 minus cosine alpha uh, sine theta 1. And sine theta 1 we get from uh, Snell's law. 
And uh, for cosine theta 1, we use uh, that cosine square theta 1 plus sine square theta 1 equals 1. And if we plug in uh, the formula for sine theta 1 in that, uh, we get uh, this relation. So we have this term, uh, we have uh, that term, and of course sine alpha and cosine alpha are just given because of the uh, prism angle. Since we know what uh, sine theta 2 is, we can use Snell's law to get uh, sine theta reflected. So this is how you would treat a double refraction from two surfaces that are at an angle with respect to each other. Let's now talk about a, a new phenomenon. Uh, what happens if Snell's law demands that the sine of the refractive, uh, re refracted angle is uh, bigger than 1? Uh, this, of course, is impossible for any real angle the uh, theta refracted. It can only happen if you go from a more optically dense medium uh, to one that is less dense. For example, we can go from water into air. In any case, whenever we have refraction, we always have, in, in addition to the refracted ray, a reflected ray. Uh, those two things occur to, uh, together. If this condition is met, there's just the reflex, reflection. And uh, I'm going to uh, show that with this uh, water tank that uh, we saw uh, two days ago. So I'm injecting a light ray uh, in, uh, in the water, and then it refracts for on, from the horizontal surface, and we can see the refracted ray and if I increase the incident angle, you start to see uh, the reflected ray down here. And if I increase it a little bit further, then uh, the refracted ray becomes horizontal. That means that sine theta refracted equals 1. So now we are hitting the, uh, the, uh, this condition. If I move a little bit more, then there is no longer a, a refracted ray, and the only ray that is left is the reflected ray. And so that angle, you can see that here is about uh, 49 degrees, and we can calculate that angle uh, simply from the condition that uh, this critical angle, sine theta c, must be the ratio of the uh, refracted to the incident uh, index of refraction. When you are exactly at this critical angle, then the refracted angle is 90 degrees. So that uh, corresponds to uh, this point K here. Total internal reflection has, uh, has many uh, applications. But before we go into that, let's consider an, uh, an example. Uh, let's say that we have a person who is inside a lake or a pool and look straight up at the world from beneath the uh, perfectly smooth surface. And the question is, how does that look like? For the answer, uh, we, uh, we know the index of refraction of water, 1.33, and we know the index of refraction for air, which is 1. And so the ratio of those two is 0 0.75, and we get the uh, sine of the critical angle as 0 0.75. That means that the critical angle is 49 degrees, just like uh, I just showed with the uh, water tank here. So up to an angle of uh, 49 degrees, the uh, person in the pool can see the outside of the pool. Uh, beyond that angle, the person will see just the reflection from the ground and from the walls of the pool or the lake. So in other words, we will have a, a, a circle. And the entire outside world is projected into this circle. And beyond this circle, uh, we just see the, uh, the ground or the walls. Next time you go, uh, you go swimming, you can try this out, how this looks like. Is it always 49 degrees? Or is it just in a specific case? Uh, uh, for water, it's 49 degrees. If you uh, try to do the same thing in very good scotch, <laughs> then the index of refraction is, uh, is different, and so it would, uh, would give you a different critical angle. And of course, everything would look a little bit yellow. As I said, total internal reflection has, uh, has many uses. Uh, it also has a certain kind of beauty to it. 
so the reason why, uh, why diamonds are in high demand as jewels is because the index of refraction is, is rather large. It's 2.42. Uh, and that means that uh, total internal reflection hap happens more readily. In this case, the critical angle is as low as 24 degrees. And that means that light is running around in that jewel uh, until it hits a, a surface where the angle is, uh, is sufficiently small, meaning less than 24 degrees, so that it can escape. And that uh, gives the diamond its sparkle. And since the index of refraction is large, the dispersion effects are also fairly large, and so those uh, sparkles are in, uh, in different colors, typically. Another application of, uh, a more technical application of total internal reflection is in uh, binoculars. So uh, often one doesn't use mirrors when one wants to reflect uh, rays, uh, but rather reflection prisms instead. For binoculars, uh, you, uh, you want to uh, invert the image because the, uh, the primary image of the binoculars uh, is inverted and you want to uh, put it back uh, the way it usually looks. And you do that with two reflection prisms, uh, like so. These work better than mirrors because uh, total internal reflection is almost without loss. So the reflectivity is, is very close to 100%. And even for, uh, for superbly good mirrors, you can't match that. Therefore, uh, since the reflectivity is so high, uh, you can have uh, many reflections with, uh, without uh, many losses. And uh, to demonstrate that, I'll have uh, little plastic bars here. And I'm going to inject light at uh, sufficiently small angles, and you can see the light bouncing around from, uh, from surface to surface and coming out at the other end. And that means these, this bar acts like a light guide, and it even works when, uh, when we bend this bar a little bit, as long as the bending angle is not too bad. And you can actually see the light coming out the other end. This becomes perhaps more apparent if I uh, inject it in, uh, in this spiral, and you can see the light coming out at that end. And of course, one can do that in, uh, uh, for various color wavelengths. We can construct optical cables uh, that are able to guide the light uh, over long distances without uh, a lot of losses. And that is very interesting for a uh, high-speed internet connection, for example. Uh, with modulated light beams and fibers, you can, you can get capacities of uh, or transmission rates of up, up to 10 to the 12 bits per second. But this is not the only application. Uh, there, are, there are also applications in medicine. So if you take a bundle of optical fibers together, then you get a light pipe. And that can be used to, uh, to transmit an image from a place where it's hard to get to, to your camera. And uh, such places could be, for example, a patient's lungs or stomach or colon. You can uh, even uh, light up the environment there by using more optical fibers uh, uh, to transmit light down there. Of course, all these fibers have to be optically insulated from each other, and that is done with a thin coating with a different index of refraction. So uh, the way this works then is, uh, let's say we have a letter A here and the ends of the fibers there, then each fiber transmits the color it is right next to, and you get an image on the other side which you can read out with a camera. Let me uh, now talk about uh, refraction at, uh, at a spherical surface. So let's consider uh, uh, a ray starting at point O and uh, uh, moving up to height H and then striking a spherical uh, surface and uh, getting refracted and then it moves to point I. And if you want to know uh, the position of I with respect to the surface and, uh, as a function also of the distance of O with respect to the surface, then we use Snell's law 
But here we make the approximation that uh, the angles ought to be small. So uh, to deal with the angles, we again consider triangles. So if the angle of point I, as seen from point P where this uh, light strikes, is denoted with gamma, and uh, theta 2 is the angle of, uh, of refraction, so this point C is the center of the spherical surface, then uh, theta 2 plus gamma plus this angle phi uh, must be equal to 180 degrees. And we can uh, solve that for theta 2, which is then pi minus phi minus gamma. And pi minus phi is the complementary angle to phi. So that is the angle beta, which is the angle of the normal, since this is the point C, the center of the spherical surface, with respect to point P. So now we have expressed theta 2 as a function of uh, the angle uh, beta, which is the direction of the normal, and the direction of the refracted ray, uh, gamma. We now consider uh, the equivalent angle with point O, and we get a similar relation. So now uh, alpha plus beta plus the complement of the incident angle has to be equal to 180 degrees. And that leads to uh, uh, theta 1 equals uh, alpha plus beta. So now we make the small angle approximation, which means that uh, we assume that the sine function and the tangent function of an, uh, of an angle equals to that angle itself. So if we have uh, n1 uh, theta 1, that is approximately equal to n2 theta 2. That is uh, Snell's law uh, for small angle theta 1 and theta 2. And since we know that theta 1 is alpha plus beta, that means n1 alpha plus beta must be about n2 times theta 2, or n2 times beta minus gamma, which comes from, uh, from this relation. So we can now uh, say that alpha is uh, approximately uh, the height h divided by the distance do, and beta equals uh, the height h divided by the radius of, uh, of curvature for this spherical surface r, and gamma equals h divided by the distance di between the spherical surface and the point i. So if we do that, then this equation here becomes n1 over do plus n1 over r is approximately equal n2 over r minus n2 over di. So just plugging in those angles. So uh, let me write this again. So we have uh, n1 over do plus n1 over r equals n2 over r minus n2 over di. That means that n1 over do plus n2 over di equals n2 minus n1 over r. And there's no h left in that formula, and that means that h doesn't matter. So any ray that strikes the spherical surface at any height, as long as the approximation is still valid, uh, will get refracted to point i. And that, that means that i is an image of the point O. This formula will also work for concave surfaces. This, of course, is a convex surface. We simply assign R smaller than zero. And if di is smaller than zero, that means the image is on the same side as the object. Uh, as an example, uh, revisit the example with the goggles uh, dropped in the pool, which uh, even though the pool is a depth of uh, one meter, the goggles appear at a shallower depth. And we can use uh, this equation uh, to get the answer a bit more quickly. So in this case, n1 equals 1.33, n2 equals 1 for air. The radius of curvature is infinite. So this is not a spherical surface, but a plane surface. So we just plug infinity in, in, in the formulas. Uh, the goggles are at point O, but appear to be at point I. So this is the image, this is the object. And the object distance to the surface is one meter. And uh, if you want to find the distance to the image, 
we use the formula, we get 1 over di equals 0.33. That is the difference of 1.33 minus, uh, minus 1. Uh, the difference between the indices of refraction divided by infinity, so this whole uh, term goes away, and then we subtract the minus 1.33 over 1 meter, which is uh, index of refraction in water divided by DO, and that gives us minus 1.33 per meter, and if we solve that for DI, we get uh, the same answer as before, 75 centimeters. And the image of the goggles, which appears here, is, uh, is virtual and it is in the water because it has a negative sign. It's on the same side as the object. Uh, can you explain why R is infinity? So if you have... A, so let's, let's say we have a sphere uh, of, uh, of radius R. And le now let's make a bigger sphere of radius uh, 2R, for example. And I can uh, keep making bigger spheres. And it will look more and more like a plane on that. And so one can uh, describe a, uh, a planar surface as a spherical surface with infinite radius. So uh, uh, th that... This also uh, is true for the mirror equation. Uh, you can describe uh, plane mirrors in, with the mirror equation, but you have to use infinite radius of curvature uh, for, the, uh, for the plane mirror. And where did you get N1 to be 1.33? Is that given? Uh, yeah, that's given because it's in water. Yeah, uh, we, we discussed this problem before, so it's, uh, since it's a pool of water, it's, uh, it's 1.33. And the reason why this is 0.33 is because we have, uh, in this formula, we have the difference of the indices of uh, refraction, n2 minus n1, and that is 1.33 minus 1 is uh, 0.33. Let's look at a uh, somewhat more complicated example. Let's say we have a point source of light that is placed at a distance of 25 centimeters uh, from the center of a glass sphere with index of refraction 1.5, and that glass sphere has a radius of 10 centimeter. And the problem is to find the location of the image. What we do here is we have uh, actually two surfaces. So first, uh, we consider the refraction of the front surface. And then, after uh, we have constructed an image for that, which is, uh, we call I1, then we go to the next surface and see if we uh, consider this first image an object for the second surface, what is the image of the image, so to speak, and that we call I2. So let's first go to the first surface, and we know that n air equals 1, and n2 is now 1.5. The radius of curvature is 10 centimeters. This is a typo. And the uh, object distance is, uh, is 25 centimeters minus the 10 centimeters. So let me write those uh, things down correctly. So uh, radius of curvature is, uh, is 10 centimeters. And uh, object distance is uh, 25 centimeters. But that's with respect to the center of the sphere. And so we have to subtract the radius if we want to uh, get the distance to the surface. And so that is 15 centimeters. So now we can use the formula uh, 1.5 over uh, the image distance is uh, the difference in the indices of refraction. Now this is 1.5 minus 1 over, uh, over 10 centimeters. And then we subtract. 1 over the uh, 15 centimeters, uh, the object distance. And this 1 is the index of refraction in air. And if we plug in the numbers, uh, then we get for the uh, first image uh, that the distance is minus 90 centimeters. And because this is a negative number, it means that source and uh, image are on the same side of, this, of the surface. So the source is here at a distance of, uh, of 15 centimeters with respect to the surface. 
and uh, the image is 90 centimeters away from this surface and on the same side. And that means the distance from image 1 to the second surface, so this is 90 centimeters, this is 1 meter, this is 1.1 meter. So now if we consider the second surface, uh, we have to use uh, an object distance of 1.1 uh, meter or 110 centimeters. And then we use the formula again. So 1 over the image distance, uh, because here we have the index of refraction in air, equals minus 0 0.5. This is the difference in the index of refraction. So the same as here, but with an opposite sign, because now we are moving from glass to air. So we have minus 1 half here. And then uh, because the surface is, uh, is concave and not convex, we have a minus sign for the radius. So uh, minus 0 0.5 uh, over minus 10 centimeters. And from that we subtract minus 1.5 over 110 centimeters. If you plug in the number, that uh, numbers we get 4 over 110 uh, centimeters. And that means that for the image I2, the distance uh, from that surface to that image is 27.5 centimeters. And because the number is positive, it means that the image is on the other side. This is 1 over 15 centimeters because you subtract uh, 1 over DO. The formula is uh, 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 NR over DO plus uh, N glass over di equals uh, n glass minus n air over, uh, over the radius. So uh, <clears throat> we subtract uh, 1 over the uh, object distance. So this is the index of refraction of air, uh, and this is the object distance from this value to get n glass over di. All those equations always work with the inverse, with 1 over, which makes it a little bit awkward to handle. And because of that, I want to uh, make an additional remark here. We are dealing with all those reciprocal e equations uh, where we sort of need to calculate quantities like 1 over a plus or minus 1 over b. Sometimes it is easier to just multiply numerator and denominator of this ratio with AB, and then you get that this is equal to AB uh, divided by B plus or minus A. So that can be easier to calculate uh, rather than, than doing it this way. I usually do it this way, but uh, both should give the same answer. Let me uh, uh, summarize this chapter. Uh, the most important uh, thing you should remember is that light slows down when it propagates in a medium. And that is described by the index of refraction, or uh, the velocity is then given as the speed of light divided by the index of refraction. Then for reflection, uh, we have the law of reflection, uh, which is that the reflected angle equals the incident angle. For the plane mirror, we have that, uh, the rule that the image is always virtual, it is always upright, and it always has the same size as the object. And that means that image distance and object distance are, uh, are the same. For spherical mirrors uh, of curvature radius r, they have a focal point, and focal point means that uh, reflections from parallel rays connect to that focal point. So uh, the focal length, the distance between surface and focal point, is uh, the radius divided by 2. And we distinguish two cases, concave and convex mirrors. Concave mirrors, we assign a positive sign for the radius. And convex mirrors, we assign a negative sign. 
And that is purely a, a convention to make the formulas work out right. Focal rays, those are rays that go through the focus, are reflected parallel. Concentric rays, those are rays that go through the center of the uh, spherical surface. They reflect on themselves. And center rays reflect like plane mirrors. So a uh, center ray is if I have either a concave or a, a, a convex or concave mirror, and this is the horizontal. So the central ray is the one that uh, hits this, the center of the mirror. And no matter what the curvature is, I always have uh, that uh, this angle equals, equals that angle. And that is uh, the same also for uh, plane mirrors, of course. So uh, this is one of the uh, uh, way to construct an image graphically. You can use the parallel rays, which go through the focus in their reflection, then the focal rays, which reflect parallel, the concentric rays, which reflect on themselves, and uh, uh, the center ray, which reflects like a plane mirror. And in general, the more rays you use, in principle you need only two to find an image, but the more you use, the better your accuracy is going to be. We can use array diagrams to construct images. We can also use the mirror equation, uh, which uh, gives us the image location directly. We can use the magnification equation uh, to tell us the ratio of the image height uh, compared to the object height. And this is uh, given by, uh, by this formula. So this is uh, minus the image distance over the object distance. So once we have found the location of the image, we also know the magnification. There are real and virtual images, and uh, real images emit real rays. So even though the image in, its, uh, in itself uh, doesn't really have reality to it, but there are actually light rays coming from that point in space. While virtual images, uh, those are just continuations that we make in our brain. Of, uh, of rays that are on the other side of the mirror. Convex mirrors only make virtual images, and those images are always smaller than the object. Just like there's a law of uh, reflection, there's a law of refraction, and the law is that the refractive index times the sine of the refracted angle equals the index of refraction of the incident medium uh, times the sine of the incident angle. And light of wavelength uh, lambda entering a medium with index of refraction n has a reduced wavelength, uh, lambda over n, and the frequency doesn't change. The light frequency determines the color, but uh, still we use wavelengths in air to describe uh, the color or to classify it. And 400 nanometers corresponds to violet and 750 nanometers co corresponds to red. The index of refraction depends on the wavelength, uh, which is called dispersion. And if we have a refractive index that is smaller for the medium where the ray goes into, the total internal reflection can happen if the angle is bigger than the critical angle, which is uh, given by uh, this expression. At the very end, I want to uh, just uh, give an introduction in the next chapter. Uh, which will discuss lenses in particular and several optical instruments. So uh, on this picture, for example, we have three lenses, uh, contact lens, the, uh, the cornea of the human eye, and the lens of the human eye. Then uh, this is a standard microscope, uh, and this is one of the best optical telescopes uh, in the world on uh, Mauna Kea in Hawaii. So what is a lens? A lens is, uh, is a conjunction of two spherical surfaces. So we have, just like we discussed before, we have a spherical surface here. But now, instead of just the glass continuing, uh, we have a, a second boundary with a different radius of curvature in, uh, in, in principle. And so now we can, uh, just like with the example with the spherical uh, glass, we can construct the final image by uh, first constructing an intermediate image. So we know that n air over d object plus n glass over d1 
equals the difference between n glass minus n air over R1. And we know that minus n glass over, uh, over D1, where D1 is the first image, plus n air over Di equals n air minus n glass divided by minus R2. So why the signs? So for R2 is because the surface curves the other way. That's the reason for the minus sign there. And uh, the reason for the uh, minus sign here is that uh, the image with respect to the second surface is on the other side. So if we add those two equations, then the n glass over d1 disappears uh, conveniently. And you're just left with n air over d object plus n air over d image equals this difference of indices of refraction times 1 over r1 plus 1 over r2. And if we divide out the n air, then this looks uh, exactly like a mirror equation, where the uh, 1 over the frequency is, uh, is given by this expression. And that means that uh, the image of such a system will behave exactly like, uh, like a mirror will. And I'm going to uh, show this real quick in the simulation. So uh, we have a lens here which, uh, with some uh, focal length. And for example, we can hit it with a beam. And when we hit, hit it with a, a beam of parallel light, then it gets focused into the focus, into one point. If you tilt the beam angle, then it goes into a different point, but in the focal plane. And placing an object in front of a lens gives images, just like the mirror produced images. So this is the image here. And this image can either be real or it can be virtual. So here we have a virtual image. And the virtual image then is on the same side as the object, while the real image is on the opposite side. So the difference between lens and mirror is that uh, the lens is a transmissive system, so uh, uh, while the mirror is a reflective system. So what corresponds to being on the same side for the lens is uh, what, co uh, what is on the opposite side for the, uh, for the mirror and vice versa. So thank you very much.